one of the interesting things which we uh, were discussing at the end of the lecture, uh, the previous lecture was that uh, the rate of uh, you know magnification or increase of the unstable oscillation predicted by Eigen analysis is somewhat different from what is obtained uh, by our simulation. In our simulation, we see a larger rate of change. Okay. So, that of course, was not very uh, surprising. Uh, in fact, uh, the reason why that probably was, was true was because we used Euler method for numerically integrating the equations, which uh, tends to uh, show an unstable system to be even more unstable than it actually is. Okay. So, that is one of the reasons why the rate of growth in the simulation seem to be much, much uh, higher than what we saw in the uh, from the Eigen analysis. Just to uh, you know uh, show you the results again, I will do that uh, in a short while from now. So, today's lecture of course, we will uh, continue with uh, our discussion of what uh, this behavior, the simulation of the uh, AVR automatic voltage regulator regulated synchronous generator which is connected to an infinite bus, but uh, uh, we will probably have more time and we can now shift uh, in this particular lecture to another topic which is the uh, uh, the issue of load models. Okay. So, there is another component or a, you know a class of components which need to be considered which are the loads themselves. Okay. So, uh, what we will do now in today's lecture was uh, the new topic of course, would be a load modeling which uh, we should uh, begin with in this particular lecture. We will of course, uh, discuss some of the remnant issues in uh, our discussion of the automatic voltage regulated synchronous generator. Okay. Now, uh, to see the results as I mentioned some time back, again I will run a scilab program uh, uh, which really displays uh, the behavior which I was talking of. Okay. So, what I was telling you in the previous class was the operating point corresponding to the torque being equal to 1 per unit appears to be unstable, because the system when given a step change in mechanical torque does not seem to be going and settling to an operating point, there is a growing oscillation. Okay. The rate of growth of the oscillation okay, is much higher than that was that was predicted by Eigen analysis. Remember, here we are giving uh, step changes in uh, mechanical torque uh, and in some previous simulations, we also saw step changes in uh, the voltage reference of the automatic voltage regulator. Remember that the final operating point to which it has to settle to must be small signal stable in order that the system go and settle to that operating point. This is not what is happening in the case of uh, the operating corris point corresponding to mechanical torque being 1 per unit. In fact, the operating point corresponding to T m is equal to 0.5 is in fact stable. Okay. So, you will find that uh, this first disturbance which in which we gave a step change of mechanical torque from 0 to 0.5 was indeed stable. The system was kind of settling down to an operating point, but the second disturbance which takes the system to a new operating point is does not settle down because the new operating point is not small signal stable. So, this is what really we were we were discussing in the previous lecture. So, just to make things even more clear, we just look at the same disturbance with uh, change in. So, our first disturbance uh, of mechanical power resulted in the electrical power settling to 0 0.5. Okay that was the first step change. The second step change taking it to 1 does not seem to settle, because the new operating point of uh, electrical torque equal to the mechanical torque equal to 1 is not a stable one. Okay. So, that is what we saw in the previous class. Now, when we did the Eigen analysis, we will do the Eigen analysis around the operating point corresponding to this. What we saw then was indeed the system is not small signal stable, because the real Eigen value has got a positive real part. The issue we were talking of was of course, that the rate of growth of oscillation of the oscillation as observed in the state variables etcetera was not as was much higher in the simulation than was predicted by Eigen analysis. So, that is one point which we discussed and we attributed that to the numerical method. I encourage you to actually try out uh, other methods like trapezoidal rule etcetera to see how much uh, uh, what is the rate of uh, you know the magnification of the oscillation. 
okay whether it it correlates better with the eigen values okay so this is something i leave to you as an exercise there there are a, a few more points which we need to examine if you look at uh, the plot of power we'll just do this again uh, we'll have to simulate it because the variables have got cleared in fact it is taking a very long time because i've used euler method with a very small time step so this is not the thing to do in uh, real programs okay now one more thing you notice is that is oscillation not just growing with time if it was a exponential growing oscillation as was predicted by eigen analysis we would eventually find that this just blows up in this fashion okay and goes off to infinity practically now so uh, this is what our you know your eigen analysis predicts but of course eigen value analysis remember is of a linearized model it's not valid for large disturbances okay so after a point uh, you know our anal linearized analysis is not valid in the sense that as the oscillation grows the deviations from the equilibrium become large and it is no longer correct to assume that our oscillation should behave the way it is predicted by eigen analysis okay in fact what we find actually is it is kind of the oscillation is kind of saturating to a steady oscillation okay now this is an interesting behavior which cannot be explained by the linearized analysis it's purely a nonlinear phenomena and what you see is that this is something which is uh, obtained only by simulation it's something we cannot predict by eigen analysis okay in fact the origin of this itself is an interesting uh, enough dynamical phenomena in fact if you look at the field voltage what we see that the field voltage seems to also oscillate and it is clipped to a certain value why is it clipped because the static excitation system has got limits okay so that is the reason why it is getting clipped now in case i do not have these this clipping action okay so if i uh, remove the limiters in the model in that case what happens now if i do that so i'll just do that for you what i'll do is i'll make the limits very very large which in fact practically disables the limits so i may instead of 7 times uh, the terminal voltage efd is limited to 70 times which is of course a very large value so for all practical purposes this excitation system is no longer limited so i rerun the simulation without with the excitation system unlimited having unlimited voltage field voltage capability and in that case this is what i get we'll plot the phase angle uh, the angle delta the rotor angle and now you are getting an altogether different behavior so if i remove the field voltage limits you are getting altogether different nonlinear we have delta is going on increasing so instead of having so if you look at what is predicted by eigen analysis around this equilibrium point is for any disturbance the deviation grow with time and go to infinity this is what small signal analysis pred predicts what you got for the nonlinear simulation was okay with euler method was a higher rate of growth initially with saturates okay this is in case exciter limits are model exciter limits are model and in case you assume that excitation system doesn't have any limits we find that this movement of delta eventually it becomes a monotonic movement as seen in this figure in fact if you expand this this will become very clear yeah do you see this so what you're seeing is the classical loss of synchronism phenomena okay so what happens is that you get different nonlinear behavior depending on the kind of excitation system model you have used in fact uh, excitation system model with limit seems to be giving us a sustained oscillation and not just a growth towards the loss of synchronism this is a classical case of loss of synchronism remember loss of synchronism is also a nonlinear phenomena okay it is not something which cannot be predicted by eigen analysis and uh, it because it's a kind of uh, 
monotonic increase in the rotor angle after a point it just goes and loses synchronism okay so this is these are interesting nonlinear uh, behaviors uh, observed in the synchronous machine in fact uh, if a machine is uh, small signal unstable there are two things which will happen you will have a sustained kind of uh, uh, oscillation because of, and it doesn't settle down to the equilibrium point or you have got this loss of synchronism you know so both these things are in fact uh, possible and uh, I will now show you a real life example or a real life measurement of a small disturbance instability. This was observed uh, on 28th August 2010. Uh, what you see in this figure is the frequency of uh, two places, two locations which are quite far apart in fact. Uh, one is in um, uh, Mumbai and the other is Ahmedabad both in the western region of our country. What we see is that the frequency which is near about 49.9 hertz is in fact not constant you know the, uh, out here there seems to be uh, an operating point change and thereafter you see that the frequency at Ahmedabad seems to grow with time and then settles to a sustained oscillation which in fact lasts for more than a few minutes. So, you just see how it is just going on and on. So, this is an example of small disturbance stability which has been observed and if you look at the frequency of swings of these swings it is roughly you know corresponding to 1 hertz. So, this is in fact an electromechanical swing which is observable in the frequency measured at Ahmedabad and you see that the frequency uh, does not damp out. In fact, it does damp out, but only after the operating point appears to change. So, it just goes on and somewhere here the operating point changes which is seen by a slight change in the frequency and then this oscillation peters out. Okay. So, this is an example of uh, small disturbance uh, oscillations uh, uh, you know of poorly damped small uh, uh, low frequency oscillations or swings and this was actually observed in our Indian grid. Okay, so, we will just have a look at it again, we will just run through it again. Yeah. So, these are the frequencies measurement and there is the frequency and finally, the oscillation dies down after a change in operating point. So, you have a sustained oscillation for almost 5 minutes. So, it shows that that particular uh, operating point was in fact small disturbance unstable. Of course, if uh, the system tends to lose synchronism or in some cases uh, when you have got sustained oscillation, there is a good chance that some uh, relay or protective relays which are present in the system may pick up. They will see that something abnormal is happening and uh, if uh, it fits in the logical conditions which are given for relay tripping operation, they may actually trip out the machine. So, we should of course, take our uh, results is not the full story. In fact, once uh, a system is unstable, it is possible that there may be a relay operation at some point of time uh, when the response is playing out, the unstable response is playing out. So, this is something you should keep in mind. Okay? So, the things which you uh, now should remember about our AVR modeling and simulation, what are the issues, what are the special issues? We have of course, done the modeling and behavior of the AVR and the special behavior when it becomes unstable under certain circumstances. So, these are the special issues, these are not the issues of an automatic voltage regulation system. In fact, if the system is stable and designed well, you may find that uh, you will not come across instability that often. In fact, it may happen once in a while for situations which you have not envisaged okay, when you are doing your design. Okay. But more often your voltage regulator will behave normally and you will have a stable response okay, and you will have good voltage regulation and so on. Okay. So, we should not take instability as the, the thing which always occurs. Okay. It occurs under special circumstances. Now, uh, the thing of course, is that it does occur sometimes. Okay? That is something which you should keep in mind. Now, the issues which we have seen in this uh, first part of our lecture today was that uh, there are two kinds of nonlinear behavior which may manifest itself uh, themselves and the, those are uh, will not be predicted by small signal analysis. Okay? There are sustained oscillations and the loss of synchronism. Okay? 
Loss of synchronism incidentally can take place under other circumstances as well. If there is a large enough disturbance, you may also lose synchronism. Okay? We saw the situation in the latter simulation which we did today in which the system lost synchronism because the rotor angle went on increasing with time and after a point it just split from the infinite bus to which it is connected to. Okay? Split I mean the system may still be connected but your rotor angle has become very large and keeps on becoming large and the machine kind of slips against the infinite bus. There is a pole slipping taking place okay? and as I mentioned some time back as you have pole slipping and other unstable responses it is very likely some relays also would trip. So, in that sense our simulation is not really complete. Okay? So, uh, we saw loss of synchronism because of small signal instability. This also can occur or you can have sustained oscillations. This is also can occur. Okay? Now, uh, one of the other issues which are special to our discussion of uh, automatic voltage regulation systems was our de definition of Q, V and angle during transient. Nothing to do with automatic, uh, automatic voltage regulation systems per se, but as we analyzed it, we did come across definition of a reactive power, voltage magnitude and angle during transients. Okay? So, uh, just to these are important things which you should remember. These are definitions. It is difficult to assign a physical meaning to voltage magnitude, reactive power and phase angle during transients. Okay? That is difficult to do. So, these are definitions. So, once the definitions which you should remember as voltage magnitude is root of V d square plus V q square. This is a definition of voltage magnitude during transient conditions as well. Reactive power can be defined as okay. this is the reactive power fed into the uh, terminal uh, generator terminals from, uh, from the generator. Okay. This is Q. Okay. This something uh, is consistent with our definition of reactive power in steady state. So, it is up to you to prove that our definition of reactive power in steady state conforms to this definition in transient. So, this is an interesting thing which you should try to prove. Okay. Similarly, phase angle theta during transient can be defined as V d by V q. These are, these are all interesting things. Okay which are uh, which do not have it is difficult to assign physical meaning to them during transients, but they conform they can be used and conform to the steady state definitions in steady state. So, in steady state you will indeed find that our intuitive idea of what voltage magnitude of a sinusoid is, is what is being given by V d square plus V q square the square root of that. Similarly, the this definition conforms to the definition of reactive power in steady state. Okay. So, this is something you prove. So, this is also something you should prove. Okay. Yeah. The other special issue which uh, I did not I have not tackled here is that uh, you have other kinds I remember when we discussed our uh, automatic voltage regulation system or the excitation system in general you had basically this excitation system power apparatus then you have got the control system which is essentially the regulator. Okay. But the automatic voltage regulation function is not sacrosanct you know uh, in case uh, in case any limit of the synchronous generator is hit. Suppose the field current limit of the synchronous machine has been exceeded in the sense that the field current has become too large and it causes excessive heating of the field winding. What we would like to do is once this limit is hit we can sacrifice what we need to do of course, is reduce the field voltage. Okay? So, what one can do is suppose this is your AVR, suppose and uh, this is your static excitation system a simple model which is just the limit. This is the voltage limits at the output of the static excitation system, but on the other hand if a field current limit is exceeded what you need to do is reduce reduce the field voltage. To reduce the field voltage, we will have to reduce the field uh, the signal given to the AC to DC converter the thyristor converter okay, by the AVR. Okay. So, one thing you can do is have a summing block here plus and minus in case. So, I will just write the logic here in case field current is exceeded. 
override override or modify the order given by the automatic voltage regulator and reduce the field voltage. So, that is the thing you ought to do. So, I will not spend much time on what logic you can use. In fact, you can instead of reducing the field volt the control order given to the static excitation system, you can also instead modify the field voltage reference itself. You can reduce the field voltage reference in case the field current limit is exceeded. Okay. Remember of course, uh, this is a point of practical concern when you are designing a logic is that when the field current is exceeded, it exceeds its steady state limit. It is not necessarily to necessary to do anything right away. The thing is that the since the time constants for heating up of the rotor are much higher okay, or larger, you can wait for a few seconds. It is not going to the machine is not going to get uh, immediately it will not exceed its temperature limits. Okay. So, for a short while you can you can in fact sustain a slightly larger value uh, of field current than the continuous limit. Okay. So, uh, in fact for a short while say for a few seconds you can uh, in fact exceed the field current by say 1.2 or 1.3 times the steady state limit. Okay. Thereafter, you can actually start dropping down the current. Okay. So, what basically is important is that the temperature of the rotor should not rise, the rotor winding should not rise okay, beyond the rate. So, for that you can sustain for a very short while a larger field current than the continuous maximum limit, okay, a maximum limit under continuous conditions. Okay. So, it we can call it some kind of transient rating of a synchronous machine may be higher than the continuous rating of the synchronous generator. Okay. So, your whatever uh, logic which you use in your designing of uh, the excitation control system should use uh, the fact that the system has got higher transient ratings okay, than the steady state rating. So, for short while you can in fact use the field forcing capability of a synchronous generator to improve uh, the response of a synchronous generator. Okay. The other thing which uh, uh, is used in uh, uh, automatic voltage regulation system or other I should say the excitation control system which also includes the regulation system as one the major component is the stabilizing function. The stabilizing function uh, or the stabilizer is something which does not act in steady state at all. So, those in steady state you should do voltage regulation. If some limit is being uh, hit modify the regulation function override it slightly. Okay. But both these limiting functions and uh, the regulation functions are to a large extent steady state functions. Okay. But if you want to use improve a dynamic response. Okay. For example, we saw that for a particular operating point your uh, oscillations were unstable, they were small signal unstable, they were pre predicted by linearized analysis as well to be small signal unstable. In such a case, you can modify your basic control system. Okay. So, for example, you could this is the automatic voltage regulator this is giving E f t. You could for example, put in a modulating signal or an additional signal to modulate the AVR reference in a certain way, so as to improve your stability. So, what you are doing is take a signal in which this oscillation is observable, take some signal for example, the speed, power etcetera, design a control system, design a transfer function, appropriate transfer function and modulate the voltage this uh, modulate V ref at this summing point, so that the oscillation which which would possibly grow with time for certain operating points is in fact stable. So, this is in some sense a controller design problem. Okay. You are designing a an additional loop, additional uh, stabilizing loop in your system which already exists, so as to make your system stable. So, this is something you could do. Of course, the question uh, which may be asked which is very natural is that instead of having this particular loop, okay, this particular loop here why cannot we just modify the transfer function here. Okay. So, instead of just having k a upon 1 plus s t a, the thing is that the parameters of the AVR in fact do affect 
the uh, you know the response uh, you know the stability of the swing mode if i change this k this is something i did not actually simulate and show you but this is something you can try to uh, do it try to do it yourself you change the avr gains or instead of a simple proportional gain you have a proportional gain in addition to a lead lag block so if you have got all these things it is possible in fact for you to modify the stability uh, of various equilibrium points okay but uh, normally uh, this is not what is done in fact you will have this extra stabilizing loop which is provided here okay so you have got some thing which modulates the v ref and by doing that you try to uh, improve the response so let me just put it this way so what you are trying to do here just take a minute yeah if this is your system this is your v ref this is your synchronous machine uh, uh, excitation system etc you have got a variable like speed or delta or power in which this oscillation is visible delta is a bit difficult to measure using just local measurements okay but speed and power you will certainly see these oscillations along with delta so you can take speed as a feedback signal design a controller and modulate this voltage reference itself okay this is what i really mean okay this controller is also called a stabilizer because it has no steady state function okay so it in fact should not uh, you know you know override or interfere with the voltage regulation function too much so you will have to limit this okay another thing is that during steady state it should not affect your voltage regulation function. So, a controller of this kind will always have some high pass filter component which will prevent any output from coming out in steady state conditions. So, this is the generic way how people try to uh, stabilize oscillations. The, the other option as I mentioned is do not have this loop, but you play around with the gains of the AVR also the structure of the AVR itself. Okay? So, this is also conceivable but this is found to be a better way of doing things because you can actually choose uh, variables in which the oscillatory uh, mode is more observable okay? and therefore, how you can have a much more effective stabilizer this way. Okay? So, this is something of course, stabilizers is uh, something when we, uh, we will just do briefly when we understand methods of enhancing system stability. Okay? Now, uh, let us just uh, go on to another uh, point, we will not really go into stabilizer design at this stage, that is the topic of uh, doing other kinds of simulation. Now, we have really done in this particular uh, uh, past couple of lectures, two simulations, uh, we have done simulations as well as eigenvalue analysis uh, of disturbances like step change in VREF. In fact, step change in VREF is very much doable. You go to a power plant and you go to an excitation system, there will be a provision for you to uh, which will allow you to give step changes to an automatic voltage regulator. So, doing this step change is very much possible. Okay? It is a realistic disturbance which you could do give. Okay? In fact, a system operator may wish to change the VREF. Why is this facility given not just to test, but VREF may be changed by a system operator or a plant operator uh, based on the reactive power output which he wants out of a synchronous generator. Okay? So, VREF in fact is decided by us okay, if we are operating the power system or a particular generator. Okay? But uh, the other disturbance which we consider that step change in mechanical torque is not really very realistic. We cannot really give step change in mechanical torque, it is not an easy thing to do. Uh, the prime mover systems are much, much less uh, amenable to this kind of uh, step changes. In fact, to give a step change in uh, torque, what conceivably you would have to do is suddenly increase the, you know, in some sense the steam force on the turbine, okay, which is not really feasible. Okay. But we nonetheless use that as a disturbance just to show uh, a certain phenomena. Okay. So, just uh, we will keep the realistic things in mind. Uh, a more uh, important disturbance which does occur which we could have tried to simulate using this uh, simulator uh, you know this uh, simulation which we did was simulation of a fault okay simulation of a disturbance in the form of a fault so fault is a short circuit okay due to uh, loss of insulation in the system 
So, you could have a transmission line in which the insulation insulation is broken down on some insulator as a result is a flashover okay, between a conductor and a tower and that is a short circuit effectively. Okay. So, that uh, is a fault and a fault is usually cleared by protective action by tripping of the faulted line. Okay. So, there is a there is a system which actually senses this and trips it out. Okay. So, you can in fact, so what we did was we studied very benign disturbances, in fact some of them unrealistic like a step change in torque. We can in fact give other disturbances, for example, we could have model instead of one line, two lines okay, and assume that at some point of time there would be a fault here that is V d V q at the terminal of the generator would become 0 and as a result of which uh, some protective relay would act and this line would be out. So, you would need to change your equations. Okay. So, whenever there is a sudden disturbance like a fault, your equations of the system change. So, your simulation in fact would require you to not change the inputs, but like in the case of VREF and TM, but in, in case of a fault you would need to change your mathematical equations which describe the system itself. Okay. So, if you got a three phase fault for example, you would need to put V d V q equal to 0 for the faulted duration. Once the fault was cleared, you would have to write your uh, equations describing the interconnection only one line would be present after clearing of this line. So, you would need to modify the equations. Okay. So, this is something is not very difficult to do, you uh, you can try to do it yourself, you try to give a small disturbance uh, rather a rather a large disturbance in the form of a fault and then you trip the uh, one of the, tran the transmission lines on which you have a fault. Okay. So, this is something you can try to attempt to do. Of course, uh, one uh, point you know it is uh, important to raise it at this juncture is that in case you have got an unbalanced fault, you have got an unbalanced fault, there is one problem which you will uh, come across is that your model of the network or interconnection using d q variables may be of less value, because uh, when you do the d q transformation of an unbalanced system unfortunately, you will not get time way invariant differential equations. Okay, You will have differential equations with vary with time. So, please chew on this, just think over this uh, and contemplate what would happen in case you did have an unbalanced system. If you apply it for example, uh, d q transformation on an unbalanced star connected R load, a resistive load, okay, just a star connected resistive uh, network, you will find that uh, the the equations which describe them would suddenly become time variant in the DQ frame, okay, when you in the new variables. Okay. So, this is an important point which you should remember. Okay. So, you need to handle this in when you try to simulate practical disturbances, because faults most of the times are in fact single phase faults, okay. single phase faults which uh, are the most common type of faults, okay. single line to ground fault and so on. Okay. So, when you use uh, uh, d q frame first thing you will of course, have to consider the 0 sequence equations. The second thing is that the d q equations, equations in the d q variables will become time variant. Okay. So, when you simulate you will have time variant components in your system. Okay. So, let us go uh, now just uh, we have kind of concluded our discussion of uh, uh, automatic voltage regulation systems and uh, excitation systems. Let us just look uh, at where we stand a kind of bird's eye view. We have completed uh, the modeling of excitation systems uh, right now. Uh, we have also done modeling of synchronous machines and the general analysis, general principles for the analysis of dynamical systems. What we need to do in the next uh, couple of lectures or maybe three lectures is the modeling of loads, prime movers and transmission line. These are important components which we should consider in our discussion. Okay. Before we move on to a relatively shorter uh, discussion of stability of interconnected systems. In fact, we have studied a bit of this uh, in the simulations which I have shown. I have shown you loss of synchronism, small signal instability uh, at certain uh, operating points. Okay. These are phenomena which actually occur and I have tried to show them with a very simple system. In when we talk of uh, stability of interconnected power systems later on, we will move on from studying just a single machine system to multi machine systems as well. Okay. Uh, 
I have already uh, kind of introduced you to how you can make stability analysis tools. You have to make basically, you have to numerically integrate uh, the differential equations or do an eigenvalue analysis of the linearized systems around equilibrium points. So, these are the basic tools uh, in our armory, okay, which we can use to attack this problem. Uh, of course, we'll. I have already given you a hint of how you could improve uh, the stability, uh, say the small signal stability of uh, a system by making improvements or designing uh, or or constructing additional loops, controller loops in your power system. Okay, so we will discuss this aspect as well. Okay, later again. Now, uh, one of the things uh, we'll move on to today is the modeling of loads. Loads, of course. Uh, are difficult to model, you will you'll appreciate that in a large power system, okay, uh, loads in fact, uh, you cannot talk of an individual load. I mean, it, it, if for example, if I am studying the Indian power grid, okay, the whole uh, you know uh, grid, let us say that the southern grid of the system, which is a uh, of this country, which is a synchronous grid. So, the southern grid of our country is a synchronous grid. Now, if I am going to talk of load on the grid, uh, we, we actually have a vast uh, or, or a huge diversity in the kind of loads which we have. In fact, even if you look at the loads in this studio, they are in fact uh, many and varied. In fact, you have got incandescent lamps, you have got this uh, computer load, uh, then you have got an air conditioner which is uh, right now off because it hums a bit and uh, uh, many other loads which I have not mentioned here. Okay. So, when you are talking of uh, modeling loads in a system, do I have to model everything and anything in detail? For example, do I have to model the motor in an air conditioner okay? or do I have to consider every each and every bulb? Okay? Now, you will realize that this is uh, will get us nowhere because when you are talking of the dynamics of the complete southern grid, which has millions of loads, okay? millions of individual loads. Okay? it will become impossible to do a, any kind of analysis of uh, the kind I have been mentioning. Okay? You cannot really uh, find, you will not be able to come up with any useful inferences because the system will become too large to handle You will, and even more uh, worse, you will not have the data okay, of each and every load. Loads keep on changing uh, depending on the day, weather, season and you know and so on. So, it will become an impossible situation to model loads. Okay? So, what we really need to do is aggregate loads wherever we can. Okay? Now, aggregation by aggregation I mean I will uh, aggregation and not only uh, clubbing together of similar loads, but even modeling them by some gross characteristics. We do not really go into uh, very much in detail unless we feel that indeed there is a reason to really model each and every uh, some particular component in detail. For example, if you have got a few a few large motors in the system okay, uh, you know of say uh, several megawatts like our power plant auxiliaries. In some cases you may require to model depending on what study you are doing model each and every individual load in the power plant itself. Okay. So, th that depends on the nature of the study you are doing. Okay. But more often than not, many loads can in fact be clubbed and uh, we will we have to flag off loads which need to be considered in much more detail. So, most of the loads will be modeled by some general and aggregate uh, 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 method and uh, special loads of course, you will have to flag off and model in detail, okay? special large loads. Okay? So, that is what we need to do. Uh, load at a bus, okay? the simplest way you can try to model a load is simply by describing how its real and reactive power, uh, the amount of real and reactive power it absorbs as a function of frequency and voltage. So, you know you can just make a algebraic relationship between P and Q of the load and the frequency prevalent frequency and voltage and the bus to which it is connected. Okay? Now, the best, uh, the simplest way you can do it is some kind of simple polynomial or, or a simple first order polynomial representation. For example, P by P 0 is equal to 1 plus K P V 
into delta v this is a simple representation okay for uh, it will be valid for practical uh, for small changes in voltage and frequency okay this is a algebraic representation so kpv and kpf are some parameters which you have to take out a kind of uh, uh, for that aggregated load okay so uh, what is p0 uh, so p by p0 is the normalized power power at the normalized uh, so p is equal to p0 when delta v and delta f which are the deviations from the normal nominal voltage and frequency take place okay so sorry uh, p is equal to p0 when delta v and delta f are in fact zero okay so, delta v and delta f are the deviations from v naught and f naught. So, this is one representation of the load and similarly q by q naught is 1 plus k q v q f delta f by f 0. So, this is a neat way of writing down uh, the aggregate characteristics of certain loads. Okay. So, uh, when you do not have for example, any data it may be a good uh, or rather you do not have very detailed kind of data it may be a good idea to try to fit the characteristics roughly to these algebraic equations. So, this is the uh, uh, you know equation for the loads. Now, of course, when you are making a aggregation it would be nice to know or whenever you are deciding your these parameters k p v, k p f, k q f and k q v it would be good to know uh, you know for example, what are the various components of the load. I mean I am not saying uh, to the last detail you know, but for example, if I know that uh, at IIT Bombay our loads are mainly lighting and air conditioning loads, okay? then I can get a proper uh, roughly from uh, you know other studies which have been carried out by others. Uh, you can get this uh, uh, you know you can put in a value of kpf and kqf which fits in well with this kind of load okay this kind of load mixture okay so for example it is uh, uh, people have carried out studies and they found that for air conditioners for example uh, a window type air conditioners okay their power factor can be approximately 0.8 0.82 or so. So, these are uh, obtained from certain studies obviously, they will change depending on the rating of the air conditioners and so on. And this K P F K P V is for example, for air window air conditioners it has been found in certain studies that 0 0.47 approximately K Q V is approximately 2.5 k p f is roughly 0.5 and k q f is minus 2.8 so this is a one particular load characteristic okay which you can uh, which uh, you can use you know. So, if there is a lot of air conditioning load or a certain proportion of the load is air conditioners then you can model one chunk of the load in this fashion okay, with the appropriate values of k p v and uh, and so on. Okay. Similarly, I mean let us just talk about for example, uh, water heater. So, water heater is basically a voltage dependent load it has uh, practically no uh, you know re, uh, it does not draw reactive power and it is not dependent on frequency you do not expect uh, the heating of the element of uh, any heating kind of load like water heaters to have uh, any uh, thing other than the real power dependence on voltage. Okay. So, what you will find is k p v is 2. Okay. In fact, if you uh, just a moment. So, k p f and similarly k q f k q f k q v is equal to 0 power factor is of course, uh, 1 this is the power factor. So, this is the water heater for example. Okay. So, you will find that uh, for this particular class of loads your uh, this is what you will get. Similarly, you have got fluorescent lighting 
and uh, and so on. So, you should uh, in fact, uh, you can for example, look into the load modeling chapter of the book by Kundur, which I have mentioned some time back and uh, look at a wide variety of uh, loads and their characteristics, which are given there. Okay. Uh, one of the things, uh, which probably could be of in interest is industrial motor. In an industrial motor, in fact, has got uh, a certain class of industrial motors has got power factors of, uh, of 0.88, Kp V of 0 0.07, which is means it is not really voltage dependent. K P F, which is 2.5, which is fairly go, um, of high frequency dependence, and K Q V, which is 0 0.5, and K Q F, which is 1.2. Okay, so you see this uh, fairly large variation in these constants. So what we need to do is, once you have got a load bus, it's better to first split it up into various components of loads, you know like lighting loads. Okay. Lighting means whether it, you have to really distinguish whether it is primarily incandescent or is it uh, fluorescent. Uh, then the motors, air conditioners, this could be industrial motors, air conditioners and therefore, get a kind of uh, you know describe these individually uh, by the appropriate K P F and K Q F and so on. Okay, and then get a kind of characteristic of the final load and reactive power load which appears on the system. Okay, actually drawn by the system. Okay, so this is what you need to do. Sometimes, of course, uh, even this uh, when you are doing a, a large study, even this may be very tedious to at this kind of data may be very tedious to get. So you may find, in fact, people. Uh, kind of classifying loads as residential, uh, uh, commercial, there is official office spaces, etcetera, and industrial, usually manufacturing industries, etcetera, and power plant auxiliaries. So, you can have these load classes, and similarly, for these load classes. Uh, we can actually get this K P V and K Q V and so on constant. So, if you know for example, Mumbai load is this much of it is residential or domestic, this much is commercial. So, you can actually get an aggregate load model for Mumbai okay, as uh, partly commercial, partly residential, partly industrial and in wherever there are power plants right at that bus, you have got power plant auxiliaries. Remember the steam power plants require substantial amount of auxiliary power, you know for their pumps etcetera. Okay. So, uh, you will find that that itself uh, may be 5 to 10 percent of the plant output itself, the rating of all the auxiliaries. So, that itself is a quite a substantial load. Okay. That also has got certain characteristics. So, I refer you to the book by Kundur, which gives uh, these uh, characteristics in one place. Okay. You will find that given in one place. Now, um, What I mentioned to you, the load model you can say, which I mentioned to you here is in fact a static load model. It is an algebraic relationship between P and V and P and F and so on. Okay. A better way of uh, representing uh, uh, loads would be with a dynamic model, but as I mentioned, it would be too difficult first of all to get the data for the dynamic models. But certain loads, you know, like very large motors, you know, which may be present in some places, you know. Uh, for them, you could flag out these loads, in fact, uh, and then model them in detail. For example, induction machine loads, okay, very large induction machines are there, you know, several megawatt rating machines are there. So, those machines you may try to flag out and model separately as dynamical equations, okay, instead of static equations. So, if you look at induction machines, they also come out and come, uh, you know, uh, the modeling of induction machines may be required in another context. Okay. Uh, not only have you to model large indust, uh, induction motor loads individually using dynamical equations, very large, okay. I am talking of megawatts whenever you are studying uh, a grid, those kind of motors. 
the other context in which induction motors really uh, or induction machines may uh, manifest themselves is when you are trying to model induction generators. Now, many of the for example, wind farms or wind um, generators are in fact induction generators and it is a good idea and they are also many uh, very often connected to low voltage system. So, they are almost like negative loads, negative induction motors. Okay. So, you may actually have to model certain large induction motors as well as large induction generators okay, uh, in your grid individually using differential equations. Now, how do you do that? Remember, we will just uh, not go very much deep into this, uh, I will just indicate how we can do it using the synchronous machine equations themselves. Now, just remember that I mentioned some time back that you can get a simplified model of a synchronous machine using a 1.1 model that is one winding on the d axis on the rotor and one winding on the q axis of the a synchronous machine on the rotor. Okay. Now, so the equations which you get in fact are given on the screen. We have done this uh, in the 22nd and the 23rd lecture and the q axis equations are these. So, these are of, of course, of a synchronous machine. Okay. Now, an interesting question to you is uh, which I just uh, kind of hinted uh, in that lecture also was that using the 1.1 model in fact, you can get a model of an induction machine as well. Okay. How do you get that? Well, you need to make uh, just remember what an induction machine looks like, usually it has a round rotor configuration, there is no actual distinguish distinction between the d and the q axis, okay. uh, especially of a squirrel cage machine, it is very difficult to define what is the d axis and the q axis. Okay, if you got a squirrel cage, it looks exactly the same in both axes. Okay. So, in such a situation, uh, what you see is that you cannot have a distinguish, uh, distinction between the parameters of the d axis and the q axis. Another important point which is there is that there is no field voltage applied to a particular winding on the d axis. Okay. The d axis and the q axis look exactly the same, okay. even if you are modeling it with two windings the parameters of the winding will look exactly the same. Okay. The EFD is 0, because you are not applying any field to the voltage to the field winding, the, uh, there is no field winding. So, the field winding in fact has to be converted to a damper winding, which is short circuited onto itself. So, your EFD has to be made equal to 0. So, if you want to convert the synchronous machine model to an induction machine model, then what you need to do is T q dash, T d dash have to be made equal x d dash x u dash in this 1.1 model have to be made equal and x q and x d also have to be made equal and e f d has to be set to 0. Okay. So, what you will get is a model of an induction machine. Okay. It is effectively like two damper windings one on the d axis and one on the q axis. Otherwise, the machine looks exactly the same. It has no saliency either in transient conditions or in uh, steady state conditions. Okay. Of course, uh, it is all very well to say okay, now we have got the model of an induction machine, uh, but typically if you look at induction machine theory etcetera, you will get your parameters in terms, terms of the leakage reactances, stator leakage reactances, the stator mutual reactants rather the mutual reactors, uh, mutual reactants x m. You will also get uh, the rotor leakage reactants referred to the stator x r and from that in fact, you can get the parameters x dash x and t dash which I have just mentioned using these formulae. Now, this is not difficult to prove in fact, uh, you can take the 2.2 model of a synchronous machine set r k and h uh, r h tending to infinity to open the two extra damper windings, then you will get 1.1 model. You can use uh, the basic equations of the synchronous machine as uh, described in the 11th, 12th and the 13th lecture of this course and actually derive these x x dash and t dash. Okay. So, this of course, uh, as I do to many tedious things uh, which are which we have to derive, I leave it to you okay, to derive this. Now, uh, 
there are some uh, other issues uh, for which we do not have adequate time in this particular lecture. We will revisit this in the next lecture. Uh, when you say I have converted the synchronous machine model to an induction machine model, well what do you mean by rotor angle? First thing is a synchronous machine behaves differently from an induction machine. In fact, in steady state the synchronous machine speed is equal to the voltage source to which it is connected. Okay, so, rotor uh, uh, the speed is in fact equal to the voltage source to which it is connected. A rot induction machine in fact does not behave that way except when it is under no load conditions. Okay. Uh, rotor angle is is manifest in the torque. The question is, is it manifest in the equations of an induction machine torque? The answer is no. This is something we will discuss in the next next lecture. In a synchronous machine, yes, uh, you can show that your torque is in some way related to the angle delta, but in an induction machine, it is not. Okay. Another thing is we of course, will need to most often model induction motors. So, there is some change in convention which we may have to do because we have derived a synchronous machine equations in the generator convention, currents going out of the machine, the mechanical and electrical torques in certain direction with reference to the rotating direction and so on. So, we have to actually discuss this issue in the next lecture. Okay. Uh, also, we will also discuss the mechanical torque and speed dependence. This is something we will also have to discuss in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we will also hint at how using the dynamical tools which we have discussed so far, that is Eigen analysis and simulation, uh, we can actually prove uh, the, the phenomena of self excitation of induction machines. I will just tell you how you can actually try to prove it. Okay? So, that is of course, something we will do in the next class.